yesterday was my birthday and uh, no real big deal. I sort of only counting tens now. So, uh, but it, it did force me to realise that I'd been in marketing for 30 years. I sort of reflect on, on calling myself a marketer and uh, I, I think we have to face it that society has a, a generally a, a pretty poor view of marketers in, in some regard. If you're a marketer and, or if you're in the advertising fraternity uh, and you use statistics, then chances are that your next door, next door neighbour probably thinks that you're a pathological liar. So it, it sort of really came to me, particularly in a, in a study I did uh, for the Institute of Chartered Accountants many years ago. And uh, they were under attack by the, uh, the Society of, uh, of Accountants and uh, they were really concerned about their image. And so they, they wanted us to, uh, to rank their, ask them to rank themselves. So they asked us to, uh, to rank them against high court judges, barristers and solicitors, doctors, uh, academics, uh, teachers, uh, nurses, the whole gambit. I remember presenting the results because they scored these accountants, marketers, as the absolute bottom of the professions. And uh, it just really, really brought home to me the reputation, the broader reputation. Not that I think that accountants are um, you know, the, the, the great source of knowledge about professional rankings. Incidentally, they rank themselves uh, uh, just beneath um, high court judges, uh, but just ahead of the deity. So, um, when I entered marketing, I did so for vocational reasons, to be honest. I was quite interested in applied economics. I was quite interested in uh, the matching principle. I was interested in consumer needs and organisational capabilities. I was interested in consumer sovereignty and customer centrality. And uh, as, as I was studying my marketing undergrad, one of my closest friends said to me, why are you doing marketing? It's, why are you studying? It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's just gut instinct. It's just common sense. Uh, she said that great marketers were born, not educated. And as much as I wanted her to be wrong, and as much as I sought to discover some theories that were, were, were rooted in, in deep theories, I couldn't find them. You know, we, we had theories like the product life cycle. Has anyone ever seen sales that actually looks like a normal bell-shaped curve? Uh, you know, oh, it's not supposed to be a true generalisation. It's, it's only supposed to be in, indicative. But as marketers, we accepted that. We decided it was a theory and we went out and, and we started you know, working with it. So the thing is that what we've discovered is that instinct without sufficient reasoning and reasoning without sufficient rigour is driving a whole lot of bad decisions. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about instinct and reasoning and rigour. So we know that instinct is mainly the product of, of the non-conscious. And we know that the non-conscious is you know, the, the, the workhorse of our brain, in, in substantially la larger than our, than our conscious. And we know that, that the conscious is really just this skinny charioteer. This skinny charioteer holding six wild stallions. And that our conscious, our reasoning, is just trying to re contain the risks that the, the non-conscious is wanting to take, the emotion. So we know about the relative power because we know about the Iowa gambling task. The Iowa gambling task is that there's four decks of cards, two of the decks have a positive bias and two of the decks have negative bias. And it takes the person betting on each card about 50 cards before they only select from the positive biased decks. But if they're wired up with, a, say, a galvanic skin response, they actually start having a physiological response after only 10 cards as they put their hand out for the, for the negative packs. So the power of the non-conscious is far, far, far greater than the conscious. So we've got this little skinny charioteer trying to hold the wild horses. And to make matters even worse, this 
skinny charity has got a problem. And the problem is that he has, he has this optimism bias, this dramatic optimism bias. Um, and, and worse than that, the optimism bias is hardwired and it's systematic and it's consistent. And, and it leads us to make assumptions which are too positive that create career shortening miscalculations. So like drug mules, like smokers, like people that live on the San Andreas Fault, we have, we're all vul vulnerable to this uh, cognitive uh, illusion and systematic uh, optimization. As Dan Ailey said, we're uh, predictably irrational. So um, just to illustrate, uh, I think that you should consider tomorrow having, having a look at some business cases that you've, you've done in the past and have a look at the the outcomes relative to uh, what was predicted. Um, the thing about um, predictions, a, a Yahoo uh, chief scientist, uh, uh, Duncan Watts, said, our enthusiasm for making predictions is matched only by our reluctance to be held accountable for them. We'll find, or you'll find, that, that the costs, the, the demand, the timing, were all wrong. Uh, but, but our reluctance to go back and look at them indicates you know, this, this positive optimism that we, we display. And to make matters worse, to make matters actually much worse, senior business managers have been found to have a far greater optimism, positive optimism, than the general population. So, we were relying on this skinny charioteer to hold this instinct, and yet the skinny, skinny charioteer is, is misleading us as well. So to check our non-conscious instinct, we need reasoning, and to check our reasoning uh, for its optimism bias, we need rigour. And it's the rigour that as marketers, we're not really good at. And it's the rigour that we need to think about. And maybe it's the lack of rigour that causes us to get that reputation uh, that the accountants uh, uh, think we have. So it would be unimaginable if a chief financial officer didn't know the accounting standards or wasn't comfortable with numbers. And yet it's not beyond the realms of possibility, and there's people that, that in here that know this only too well, that the chief marketing officer feels more comfortable with gut instinct and uh, you know, accompanying his positive uh, optimism bias than uh, rigour. So, uh, just following gra after graduate school, I decided that you know somewhere I had to find this rigor and, and in the marketing profession, and so I decided to to go into marketing research, and um, I thought I would immerse myself in the world of substance and rigor there. Uh, but what I found is just another name for for gut instinct, and it was called qualitative research, and. Uh, I'm not wanting to put down qualitative research because qualitative research is really important for developing hypothesis or better understanding attributes, but it just fan forces more gut instinct. And uh, the truth is, and we all know this, that when we look at marketing planning and the tools that are used in marketing planning, rarely do we see even the most basic statistical tools being used to bring about some sort of rigour. And yet, you know, for 50 years, the, the academic journals have been wall to wall with, with, with uh, you know, base upon which we can, we can do this sort of advanced modelling techniques, and yet we're, we're not doing it. So the, the aha moment for me in my little journey happened when uh, we were doing a, a rebranding project. And uh, I had delivered to my office all of the research that this organisation had done for the past 40 years. And there was literally hundreds of reports. And there were reports from the 1950s. And I remember looking at some of these really old reports. And there was one report that actually I could see the hole in the middle of the pie chart where the, where the, the compass had been. And, and all of the slices were coloured in. And as I sort of collated all of these, these, these um, projects, and, and some of them, by the way, were over a million dollar projects. And I, as I started collating these, I discovered that the same qualitative findings had been found two, three, four times, and yet never acted on. 
So why hadn't they been acted on? Well, senior managers don't make career bets on the murky twilight of qualitative research. Um, research findings that have you know, some probability of being right and some probability of, well, not being exactly right. So if we hope to orchestrate change as marketers, we need to continue to have our instinct and continue to have our reasoning, but to add to our reasoning some, some rigour. So I thought it might be interesting to reflect for a moment on what do the organisations know that have pursued rigour? What do they know that, that other companies that haven't pursued that rigour will want to know and will be compelled to find out by market forces? Well, well one of the things they know, some of the things that they know, is firstly, uh, they know that raising customer expectations just needly raises costs. They know that if they want to understand changes in market share, that they should be uh, using value for money as a construct. They know that awareness is a weak measure for brand health unless they're also looking at, at low attention processing. They know that brand equity is just a made up term and the true dependent variable is sales. They know that the net promoter score is just a, is just a trick for shortcut, shortcut managers. They know that every behavioural change needs an emotional detonator. They know that you cannot explicitly communicate an emotion, it must be implicit. And they know that neuromarketing cannot tell them the discrete emotions that will drive consumer behaviour. And therefore they know that neuromarketing is just a product looking for a market. So who are these organisations that know this? Who are the organisations in our community that know this and understand it and, are, and we should be following? They're the marketing department at a university who recently understood the different price, prices that they could change for, charge for a course and developed a model and were within three students of correctly predicting the demand for that, for that faculty the next year. They were the mutual fund who appended their primary survey data to their organisational secondary data to understand what the drivers were of defection and solve that issue. They were the national sporting organisation that understood through modelling that they needed to change the rules of the game, literally the game, in order to uh, continue to have mothers wanting to come and support the game and therefore uh, perpetuate the future of the game through uh, their, their children participating. They were the managers of a low-cost airline who understood to continue to be low-cost, they needed to understand how, what the hierarchy of, of drivers for driving satisfaction were so they could continue to just be low-cost but focus on just those few drivers. They were a charity that understood that the key donor group believed that homelessness was self-inflicted. They were the government department who understood that to lower workplace injuries, they had to, through their communication, lower complacency and lower happiness and raise sadness. So they are our leaders. They are the more marketing organisations that understand the link between instinct and reasoning and rigour. So I'm hoping that tomorrow we're going to announce that marketing is in rehab. I'm hoping that there'll be just three steps that we need to take. First of all, let's identify the enemy. And the enemy is gut instinct unaccompanied by rigour. If you believe that being 100% right 100% of the time has a zero probability of zero, then you're on the path. And if you believe that, that your optimism bias without rigour leads you to overstate outcomes, then, then you too are on the way. So we need to seek out and ch challenge the myths and unsubstantiated anecdotes. We need to find the fads, get rid of the heuristics and look for some, adding some rigour. And finally, we need to complement the ways of the old and, and add some of this rigour, uh, some anal this analytic rigour. And we need to recognise that the marketers of the future will have narrower skills but be much deeper. 
and therefore we're going to need to provide a translation service to the Chief Marketing Officer in a non-threatening way. So in essence, marketers are not born. They are educated, but not educated in the sense of an academic perspective, but educated in the, in the sense that they understand the place for instinct, the place for reasoning, and the place for rigour. So I have an idea worth spreading, and my idea worth spreading is that marketing's changing and we'll need to change too. Thank you very much.